Hi, everybody. Let me uh, just check with our, we on, Paul? Thank you. Whoa, baby. OK. So first thing I want to do is go around the room and ask you to tell me your name and the title of your presentation and who your mentor is. That way, I have an idea of what the, the scope of presentations are. Because I found in my experience, depending on your discipline, the way you present is, is going to change. And hopefully, what I'm going to do is give you some basic background that's going to be useful for everybody. So if we could start here. What's my your name Jenny Parrish. Jenny. Okay. I'm a senior. And um, my topic is outcomes of female patriotism, World War II waves. Is that in history, history. or American studies? History. Who's your mentor? Uh, Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud, excellent. I'm Lisa France, Lisa. and my topic is Richard Bentley's edition of Paradise Lost. Richard Bentley's edition. I thought it was written by Milton. It was. Okay, <laughs> this is a new edition. Yeah. Okay, and uh, is that in uh, literature, English, or English, who's, who's yes. your mentor? I'm working with Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, good. Next. I'm Stephanie Nunez, and my presentation is uh, characterization of the folkloid adhesion associated protein with paxin in prostate cancer cells. Is that in chemistry, biochemistry, or biology? Biochemistry. Biochemistry, and who are you working with? Dr. Booth at the Dental School downtown. Oh, okay, very good. John Weller, um, Stages of Ethical Thought. Stages of Ethical Thought. Stages of Ethical Thought. Philosophy or? Philosophy. Philosophy. Yes. And who are you working with? Dr. Weller. Excellent. And I'll let you get settled, we'll go over here. Uh, Brandon Johnson, the chemical engineer, uh, working with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I, now I recognize you. I knew I knew you from somewhere. But um, the name of my title is uh, Improving um, the me Mechanical Properties of PMMA Bone Cement with uh, Nano and Micro Particles. Okay. My name is Uzami Hegra. I'm a biology major. I uh, work with Dr. Susan Austin Rosenberg in the biology department. And the title of my presentation is uh, Uveal melanoma vaccines express major histocompatibility compatibility complex in the absence of variant chain. Okay. Are you in the same ethics class as Brandon? Uh, I'm going to have to take it. Oh, sure. but not now. Uh, my name is Matthew Loftus. I'm uh, a chemistry major. My mentor is Dr. Elisa Kelly. And <coughs> my uh, presentation is entitled Laser Stimulator Raman Spectroscopy as a Method for Atmospheric Sensing Technology. Oh, excellent. Okay, uh, now we missed here. Give me your name and your title of your talk and who you're working with. Uh, okay, my name is Brandon Stiller. Um, my advisor is Dr. Chris Swan in the Geography and Environmental Science Department. Um, the title of my presentation should be named Small and Smelly Stuff, um, <laughs> but it's Microbial Respiration of Mixed Leaf Substrates Mediated by Insect Feeding. Excellent. And back here. Um, my name is Megan Anders. My project is titled Survivors of Domestic Violence, Violence Acceptance, Cultural Factors, and Self-Esteem, and my mentor is Dr. Laura Ting. In what department? Women's Psychology. Study? Psychology? And I'm not a student. You're not a student, you're just sitting But well, I'm more than happy to give a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you give the presentation. So, now, you could all hear, and what, what's very interesting about the, the ERCAD is when you give your talk, you're likely to be giving the talk to people who are not in your department, who are unfamiliar with your discipline. And so my first suggestion is that you think of them and that words and ideas and concepts that will be unfamiliar, say something from literature might be unfamiliar to an engineer, something from biology that might be unfamiliar to a philosophy major, that you gear your talk toward a general audience. And part of what I'll talk to you today about is is what to do with the general audience. So the question is, what's the first thing we think of or that's going to hit people in your presentation? See, cleverly, I put up a title page here. But really, that's not the first thing people are going to see. Right? The first thing people are going to see is you. And how you come and how you present yourself could actually be the subject of a couple of lectures. But the idea is that the, the ERCAD, is, as Ms. McGlynn will tell you, is we like to think of it as a professional day. You're showing off your, your research professional skills, your research professional accomplishments, and so dress appropriately. Now, I decided today not to wear a tie. Why? What do you think? I knew it was on TV, too. Yes? You want this to be informal 
I want this to be informal, exactly. That's what you're going to say. I want this to be a little bit informal. I'm not giving you a professional presentation, but I want to encourage some discussion. I don't want to be the mean, cruel professor at the front of the class, you know, wearing the Armani suit, not that I have one. But I, I want us to be able to interact. And when we don't videotape this, we sit around a table, and it's a good chance for us to interact. So how you show up, how you present yourself is important. So think about that as you're preparing your talk. But then the first thing people will see in your presentation, <laughs> bless you, is, is the title page. And I've cleverly titled my title page the title page. Or, the oral presentation, Methods and Practice for the Connoisseur, ERCAD 2007, LDT Topoleski, that's me, from the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UMBC. So what have I done here? I've given you the title of my talk, and I've given it in hopefully very specific language, but also general language. I've given you the venue to remind you where you are, not that you all need it, because everybody will know it's ERCAD. But also this shows that the first thing you see is that this talk is for this specific venue. Now, I may give this talk 20 different times to 20 different groups of people not associated with ERCAD. But you guys aren't necessarily going to know that unless I tell you. So you now think that I've put all this time and effort into preparing this talk for you, which is true. I've also identified myself, and had I had any co-authors, I'd list them there. My affiliation, which is very important because when you're out in the world, you want people to know where you did this work. And we, we as UMBC faculty, staff, members of the UMBC community, want people to know and to be proud of, of your work that you've done at UMBC. And I think I'll stand over here for most of the rest of the presentation, not move around as much as I normally would, because Paul has to follow me on the camera. Now, I believe, and we can talk to Ms. McGlynn about this, when you deliver your presentation, Whoever the moderator is will announce your name and the title of your presentation. So you need not do that. Remember, you have 15 minutes. And so it's not necessary for you to repeat. Say, As the moderator said, my name is Dr. Tim Topoleski, and today I'll be talking to you about what, what, what that guy just said. It's redundant. So usually when I'm at a presentation, I just say, thank you. And I say, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Now here's an example of a title slide that I've used before called Fracture Toughness of Calcified Atherosclerotic Plaque from Human Abdominal Aortas. Now, you may not be into that particular topic, and this talk was written for a specific audience, but my title is fairly specific. And the first thing I said when I gave this talk is, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Mr. Shalesh Patel and Dr. Wolfgang Mergner, who helped me with this work. It's very important to acknowledge people who have helped you. And again, I've given my affiliation. Here's another example of a title slide that I gave last year in China. The graduate program in mechanical engineering at UMBC, and I gave a little bit more of my name, but also notice I call myself the graduate program director, which I am. Why do I do that? Well, because I'm talking about the graduate program in mechanical engineering. And so I think it gives me a little more credibility to give my title as the, as the graduate program director. Our friend here said he was a bio major, and he's going to be talking about something in biology. That makes sense, right? Because now we know you're a biology major, you have the background, and your topic seems perfectly appropriate. And it, it sounds like the, the talks you're giving, most of you are giving a talk in your main area of study, right, in your, in your major. Is anybody talking in an area that's not their major? OK, sort of. I'm giving my major from biology and psychology, but I'm using it, I'm playing philosophical context. So. There you go. So, one of the th and we'll talk a little bit about that, but certainly it, then it's valuable to discuss references. Again, credibility is important in any presentation. So if you're, if you're looking at literature from psychology and biology, that may be something that you have, not I want to say no expertise, but limited expertise in interpreting. And so you need to make sure you reference those topics so that people know that it's coming from experts in those fields and you're using, that, you're using that work. I'd like to give you a little outline of my slides, starting with the introduction. And we're going to talk about the purpose of oral presentations and motivation for organization, structure of a project presentation, how to organize your presentation, mechanics of a presentation, how to eliminate noise, and how to make effective visual aids, 
and then a summary. And I'll highlight the main points. And if we have time, I'll give you some more example slides. Many of my friends say that a good presentation has three simple elements. First element, tell them what you're going to tell them. Second element, you tell them. Third element, tell them what you told them. Right? So an outline, I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you. That's where we start. Now, many of your mentors may say, you don't need an outline slide. You have only 15 minutes to present. And that's something you have to decide on for yourself. I like to give an outline slide. I believe you can go through an outline slide. I think I was timing myself. And I'm, when I went through the outline slide, it was about 12 seconds. So very quickly, you can set the stage for your audience. Now you know what I'm going to talk about. And you're not going to be sitting on the edge of your seat wondering either when is he going to be done or when is he going to come up with something interesting. Right away, you know you're not going to be interested in this whole presentation. I think I'm ahead of the game right there, right? OK. So where is this? That's where I like to start my presentations. Who can tell me what this is? You don't count. Somebody in the last class got it, or the last presentation got it. Oops. Give you another view. Here it is. And another view. Good. It's a mountain. What was your major again? Geography, there we go. Geography major knows it's a mountain. You, your parents will be proud that you haven't wasted this tuition money. It's, it's actually Half Dome in Yosemite National Forest. I did Yosemite too. Oh, you did. Good. The, the thing about Half Dome and why I show it is that people climb up this. And they start down here in the valley, and they climb up all the way here. And they get to this part, and it's pretty much vertical. And they have to stop there for the night. And so they're hanging up against the wall in their sleeping bags overnight. So if you think you're having trouble putting together your presentation, just try this at home. Get a sleeping bag, put it up on a hook, and see if you can spend the night doing that. It's, it's pretty difficult. Well, and then they get to the top. Now, I climbed Half Dome, but I went the long way, which means you go around through the valley. And I think I have, yeah, here's the other side. You climb up through here and up there, and you rest in the saddle. And you still have to go up a pretty steep rock. Right? You're pulling yourself up with a cable, hand over hand. But when you get to the top, it's like you're in control of the world. You're right on top of this mountain. And you've sur surmounted it an, an incredible challenge. I think research, I think going to college is very much like this. Right? When you present the culmination of your work, the stuff that you've, you've stayed up nights, you've argued with people about, you've lost sleep over it, there, there's nothing like that feeling of accomplishment. But remember, you've got to climb the mountain to get to, that, to get to that point. Where's this? Here's our geography major. It's a trick question. It's actually not in Yosemite. That was going to be your guess. It's in China. It's an area of northern Sichuan China called Wulong, where most of the world's pandas live. And in fact, it's right outside of the, here it is, one of the panda breeding centers in Sichuan. And the reason I show this is because I knew I had one shot at getting to this place. I won't give you all the background. That's a much longer presentation. Well, I will give you some background. I have two adopted Chinese daughters. And we were going back to China to adopt our second daughter, but we were going to some of the places in my first daughter's province that we weren't able to get to. And I really had to argue with our guide over email and over the phone before we got to China to take us here, because it's fairly remote. And she said, you may not want to go there. I said, yes, I want to go there. I've got one chance to do this, right? One chance, one shot. And because I had one shot, I decided to do a little background reading and find out about this particular breeding center, find out more about pandas, find out more than just hopefully the average tourist would find out. And I say I have this disease because I do. It's, I, I can't stand not knowing something. You know, when somebody asks me a question or I see something, don't, don't you feel that way sometimes? hate not knowing stuff. Right? That's why we're here. That's why we're doing research. So I learned everything I could. And here, uh, this young fellow here is Mr., uh, Mr. Ling, I think. And he brought the pandas to the National Zoo. So we had a little bit of connection. I talked about the National Zoo. At least that's what I think I was saying in Chinese. And this gentleman here is the director. And we started talking. And I think he could tell. I could see in his face, he was like, yeah, another tourist. And he started looking at me with great interest, because I asked questions that a typical tourist might not have asked. And he said, you're different. You know, he said, there's something different about you. And I don't know what it was, whether he, he just thought I, I was, would appreciate it, 
but he said, you seem very interested in the pandas. Why not have a first-hand experience and go play with these? Now, who gets to do this? Nobody. Right? No, we had to pay, give him a little donation. But who gets to play with four juvenile pandas and have them crawl all over you? And, you know, of course, who gets to get a panda kiss, right? Special. The reason I was able to do this was because I made an opportunity happen. Right? And you don't know when these opportunities are going to come around again. So your presentation here for ERCAD, think of as an opportunity. You don't know who's going to be in the audience. You don't want to think of it as, ah, oh, just another thing you're giving to your fellow students at UMBC. You want to treat this as if you were giving it to the Nobel Prize Committee because you never know what's going to happen. Right, so what did I just do in my presentation? I sucked you in, right? I grabbed you and pulled you in, you know, pandas. You got to see the nice scenery, talk about Half Dome. Did it have anything to do with my presentation? Probably not. But it led me to this point where now we can talk about creating opportunities. And I hopefully piqued your interest in my talk. Now, that's a trick or a device that you may not have time to use. But you need to capture your audience's interest somehow. And this is what the introductory part of your presentation is going to do. To learn about why do you give uh, oral presentations, you know, you have 15 minutes, so you need to succinctly transfer information. And that's the idea. You could write a 30, 50, 80 page report on your work, send it home with somebody. That's going to take them a long time to read. And you want them to get to the good parts right away. We also bring the originator, that's you, the person that did the work, in contact with some target, this audience. You allow for interaction. And this is one of the main reasons to give a presentation. It's the main reason you come to school. Did you guys know this? The reason you come to school is because I'm here, right? You come to listen to me. Not me, Dr. T, but me, the faculty. Because otherwise, you could just sit at home and read a book and take a test at the end of the semester. And what fun would that be, right? Part of the learning experience is the interaction. And part of any learning experience is interaction between two people. And the two people are you, the speaker, and the audience. And then, finally, you give control of the speaker. So would you just stand up for a second? Yeah, you. And would you show everybody the? The SAE emblazoned on your shirt there. Look at that. See that? The hat. OK, sit down. Now, why did you do that? Because yeah, I told you to. Because I'm the speaker. I'm up here in control. And you guys will do whatever I tell you. Within reason, right? Actually, I like to use that example because being a speaker gives you a very powerful position. You will believe almost anything I say at this point. Why? Well, I'm fairly articulate. I have a loud voice. I seem like a professor. I ask you to stand up. I'm in control of this situation. Now, if you guys all got together and decided to riot, I probably couldn't do anything. But when you are talking to the audience, you are in control. Very powerful thing to do. And the beauty of it is you're in control to give the people an idea of what you've been doing, how glorious your work is, how excited you are to be doing this kind of research kind of cool new stuff you've, you've developed. And you don't want the audience to lose interest because you want to tell them this cool stuff. So giving a, a presentation of any kind is a wonderful experience. Now, How do you organize the talk? And why do you organize the talk? Well, first of all, having that outline that I discussed is evidence of being an organized person. Brandon will tell you, I have this appearance of being incredibly disorganized. It's sort of this myth I like to perpetuate at school. Now, I'm, I'm, my office is really messy. However, you wouldn't know that if you saw this presentation. I look very organized. And it gives you, again, more credibility. You've taken the time to put your thoughts in order. It reduces noise in transferring information. We'll talk about what noise means in the context of a, pre of a presentation. It reduces your elapsed time, the wasted time, and it looks good. Ideally, you want to be so organized and practiced with your talk 
that you can change slides in the middle of a sentence and go right on to the next slide. And I'm going to talk about structure next, seamlessly. There's no pause in between. Now, the structure of your presentation depends on the type of presentation you're giving, the audience, the time limits, and the available resources. The type of presentation we're going to talk about down here, I think in ERCAD, typically, there's going to be two things you're going to be talking about, either a progress report where your work is ongoing and unfinished, or a final report where you've done something that's complete and finished. You may still be working on the overall project, but you've got something done. How many of you are completely finished with the work you're going to be presenting? There's sort of hand with, huh? It will be, OK. And many of you have work in progress, right? Everybody else? OK. That's fine. That's what we like to see. Remember that your audience here is going to be a general audience. You have a time limit. You have a 15-minute time limit. And Ms. McGlynn said, they're not going to let you go. I've been a moderator at international meetings. And really, when the time is up, you know, I've had cases where we've literally had to turn off the microphones for the speaker and kick them off stage. And the reason for that is not because we don't want to hear you, but because oftentimes at big meetings, there's more than one presentation room here, 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 here. And people have limited amounts of time, and they may have to move on to the next presentation. You have to keep everything going in sync so that people are able to see the presentations they want to see. Let's talk about this oral progress report. I call it a progress report. It could be an interim report, but something that you're going to give at ERCAD. First of all, you have an outline that's specific to your presentation. I don't think there is much value in giving an outline that just says, I'm going to give you an introduction then the methods, then some results. I'm going to discuss them, and then I'm going to conclude it. That's not going to help anybody. I tell my students in my undergraduate classes that if they're putting up an outline before their talk, it should be unique to the talk. In other words, the next group can't use the same outline. But don't take more than a few seconds to go through it. There's the example of my outline. You couldn't use this outline for your talk, or Brandon's talk, or any of your talks. The introduction. This is where people first get sucked in, if you will, to your idea. This is where you're going to grab them. You need to give a little bit of background. Okay, What is the motivation for your work? You're trying to cure cancer. You're trying to understand the effects of domestic violence. Right? Um, you're trying to figure out why Milton didn't really write uh, Paradise Lost and why this other guy came along and, and decided to rewrite it. Is that what he did? Yeah, rewrite it in real English or something. Why, why is it important? Now, it's, it's good stuff that Milton wrote, but it's just not accessible. So this guy came along and tried to make it more, I, I'm just making this up, tried to make it more accessible to people, right? Um, but why is, why is it, uh, where does it fit in? And you're giving an overview of your research topic or your experiment or your creative work, the broad picture. Why is the work important? How does it fit in what, with what the great people who have come before you have done? Right? How does it fit in with what your advisor has done, what other Milton scholars have done, what other cancer researchers have done? This is where you reference other people to talk about what they've done. People want to see that you know that other people have done work in this area and that you're building on, on top of that. Rarely, you go to any national meeting, you will rarely find anybody who's so arrogant and haughty that they can come up and say, I'm doing the only definitive work in this subject, and no, nobody else's work matters. First of all, they're going to lose a lot of credibility, and they're probably going to lose a lot of their audience. And it just rarely happens. And give us the broad goals, aims, hypothesis, questions, however you want to phrase the focus of your work comes in the introduction. What are you trying to accomplish with this research? And not just that I wanted to get the $1,500 to do something. Here are some introductory slides that I've shown on this topic I gave of atherosclerotic plaque. I say it's an intimal lesion consisting of various degrees of fibrous tissue, fat deposition, and calcification. It's a brief definition of a term you may not know, and a brief definition or description of the, of the atherosclerotic cap. Not, I didn't want you to look necessarily at the content of this slide, but the layout and the design. All right? Very simple title, two words. 
but it, but it hits, the, hits the subject. And the sentences, and if you parse them, you, they may not even be proper English sentences. I think they are. But they don't have to be. You just want to get the concept across. And notice, that's all I do with this particular slide. And I think, Paul, you may not be able to get this on tape, but if we come to the back of the room, you can see that pretty clearly. Can you see that in the back? If you try to put too much on a single slide, oftentimes what you have up there will get lost. Here's another example. Why is plaque bad? Pretty basic question, right? It reduces the blood flow through arteries. It may result in hemorrhage, stroke, myocardial infarction. I probably should have said heart attack there. That would have been a better word, right? Gangrene of lower limbs and death, which is good or bad? Bad, right? So I motivated my talk with very few words on the slide. I may talk for a couple of minutes, but I don't put a lot on the slide. But I've motivated the work. After you've given us the introduction, give us a description of how you are answering the question. What are your methods? Are you looking at original folios of Milton's work to compare with this other guy? Are you doing a controlled experiment? Um, are you interviewing victims of domestic violence, or are you looking at a, original literature? How are you going about this? Because the methodology, the, the path you take, is going to allow the audience to critically review your work and critically listen to your conclusions. OK, so here I have what kind of apparatus, original material. You know, If you're an archaeologist, you may be on a dig site digging stuff up, questionnaire. The type of data you expect to get and the analysis method. Now, the type of data, not, yes, this drug is good for cancer curing, this drug is not good for cancer curing. But are you going to get numerical data? Are you going to get uh, the results of biochemical assays? Are you going to get data from critical, critical articles on Milton? Are you going to get questionnaire data? What are you going to be gathering in that's going to lead you toward your research conclusions? Also, this can justify, again, in, in some of the, in the more scientific areas rather than humanities, how many samples are you going to test? How many people are you going to question? How many interviews are you going to hold? If you're just going to interview one person about domestic violence, do you think you're going to be able to draw reasonable conclusions from that interview? No. That person, each person's going to be different. You're looking for commonalities, things that are common to all situations. One person may have a very skewed situation. And that's why we look at, and you look at all sorts of research, they look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different sources, whether it's from questionnaires or data. But it's very important because your audience is going to be watching that. And here I'm just showing you a slide that I did showing you the specimen geometry that I used on these little atherosclerotic plaques. And I have to tell you right away, I do not like this pink. So when I gave the presentation, for some reason we had pink there. And now I would change it, because it's hard to see, I think, some of the things inside. But it's a fairly simple graphic that gives, gives the idea. This is what I use for the methodology. I'm showing you the mathematical formula that I'm going to use to make my calculations. It's nice, big, bold. All right? Not that you guys are going to follow it, or, and I'm not going to explain it to you. But again, the point is, I'm giving you a title. It's called The Fracture Toughness. If you remember the title of my talk, Fracture Toughness of Atherosclerotic Plaque. I'm giving you the formula. It's only got three terms. and They're big and bold. And then here I've got some explanatory, explanatory work. But it's all contained on this one slide. I don't have anything else there. The next thing you're going to be talking about, again, this is my opinion. And you will talk about, to your advisor about this. Since it's a progress report and you're not finished, tell us what the status is. Tell us how much work is remaining. You know, what do you still have to do? Give us a timetable. When do you expect to do this work? You know, you already gave me a timetable. You said, it'll be done by the time I have to present. You may say, I have you know, 10 more questionnaires to gather in. I have one more set of uh, cells I have to run, something like that. So we know where you are. Again, the more you have does two, two things for us. It tells us where you are. The more experience you have, the more credible your, your talk is going to be. 
the more expertise you've built up. And also, when you can explain where you are and where you're going, that shows the audience that you really have control of your research, that you have a clear plan for finishing, finishing, finishing this up. And finally, talk about any special problems that you have either overcome already or that you still need to overcome. Again, this shows the audience that you're aware that research is tricky, it's difficult, that you don't necessarily know everything, you understand the limitations of your work, and it also shows that, that you know that you may run into problems that you have to overcome. And then give a summary. Tell us the main points that, of your presentation and reiterate perhaps the goals or your hypothesis, the methods, and the status. Again, that can be a single slide. Let me see if I have one. No. That can be a single slide just reiterating what you've talked about. So people go home with the memory of your presentation. If you're going to give a final report, the outline and introduction will be similar to what we just talked about. The description of the methods will be similar except at point C. Because now presumably, rather than saying what kind of data you expect to gather, that, that word expect, you've already gathered the data. And now you presumably have analyzed that data or gone through the the papers or done, done something with your original research material and tell us how you did that. And now you're in position to give some results. Now you also may have results in the interim progress report, but hopefully if it's a final report you do have some results. They can be in, the, in terms of graphs or tables or summary statements of, of common commonality issues that you see. But since you have a limited time, and again, because people aren't going to under understand everything, you want to present only your refined data. It's your job to sift through everything and present the data that is really going to tell the story of your work. And here I write, present results only. Some people want to discuss each bit of results as they bring it up, and that's fine. But you shouldn't be talking about conclusions, or you shouldn't, when you show some results, you shouldn't have to say, and to understand this graph, I have to give you some more background material. Because that should already have been presented. So at this point, you're showing only results. And here's an example of, again, following along the theme of the atherosclerotic plaque. I used that little test specimen I showed you, and I got some numbers. I want to point out here that I have only one graph. I don't have four or five or six different ones scattered across the page. This is the only thing I'm going to talk about when I talk about this particular slide. And it's clearly labeled. I have numbers. I have titles for my axes. So if you're doing quantitative, presenting quantitative information, regardless of what it is, you should label your axes clearly so everybody knows what's going on. My data points are large enough to see from anywhere in the room. And again, I have very few words here. So it's a big graphic, takes up a lot of space, and it's, and it's not overly cluttered. Another example for comparison. But it's, it's similar. Again, the axes are labeled. I'm using the same, notice a little, little thing, but I'm using the same symbols as I did on the previous graph. That way, you're not going to have to wonder, oh, let's say I did these in red circles and I did, and I did the other ones in purple diamonds. You're not gonna, your eyes aren't going to have to jump from purple diamonds to red circles and say, oh my goodness, why is he using red circles? And your mind is going to wander. With consistency, the, the listener's mind doesn't wander. Your focus stays on me and on the information I'm presenting to you. I'm giving you a table, for example, a table of data. This can be any kind, of, any kind of data. But again, I have a title. There's only one, two, three, four, five words in my title. Each column has its own title. Again, large, large text using fairly simple words. And each column presents the numbers nicely aligned. They're not all over the place, right? So, so that you can see them. And you can clearly read, OK? This person was 34 years old. We got four specimens. 
and our average number was 34.75. Now, if you're doing something quantitative and scientific, again, I give the units here, and I say plus or minus the standard deviation. It's very important to show what you're giving. Then, after you've presented the work, you move on to your discussion. In the discussion, you're telling us what the results mean. And here's where you guys make the big bucks. This is what any researcher is, is getting, the, getting the recognition for. You can go and create results and tabulate things and take averages and standard deviations all you want. But until you can tell us what the results mean, you are not really controlling that data. You're not in charge of that research. This is probably the most important part of any research, the interpretation. Right? Tell us the applications of the results. How can they be used? Why are they useful? Why is it good to know that Milton didn't write Paradise Lost? Limitations of your methods. Look at this. I put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars and four exclamation points. That's my little graphic to tell you that's super important. Why are the limitations important in any presentation? What do you guys think? Why is it important to come up there and say, my work is not the end, ending definitive work in this particular subject. And here are some things we have to be aware of. You want someone to come by and point that out for you. Uh, very good. You don't, <laughs> you don't want to be the victim of somebody saying, uh, by the way, um, you, know, you should have had it, the switch to three instead of two you know, to, to show that you, your work is no good. That blows away your entire research. You need to be aware of these limitations. Tell people, you know, what's sort of the sphere of, of application for your, for your presentation? When can you use the results, when not? When can you not use the results? Are you looking at domestic violence in any particular uh, demographic group? Um, yeah, English-speaking, yeah. Spanish-speaking, and then a special African. Urban African. or not? Mm, not necessarily? Not necessarily, no. So farming communities? Would your results apply to the Amish people, for example? Yeah. No. And so the idea is that you know the restrictions on your work, and it's, there's no shame, and there's, it doesn't degrade your work at all to say, this is where my work applies. However, it wouldn't apply. You don't have to say this in your presentation. It wouldn't necessarily apply to, say, the Amish community, because there's just too many differences. You don't want to imply that you can stretch your results farther than they can go. And then finally, Again, since you'll rarely see the definitive final study in any subject, giving some suggestions for future work, what you are thinking of doing, what people who come be behind you can do, to show that even though you've done something of importance, that the subject matter is still relevant and important, and we need to learn more in the future to understand what you're talking about. So I'm just giving you some this is some discussion area, statistical analysis, where I'm going to tell you about these results. I wanted to show you that because, again, to show you that this slide deals only with this statistical comparison from age groups. I'm not doing anything else. I'm really limiting that particular slide. Conclusions and summary. Go over the main points. The most important aspect of your conclusions is they must be supported by your data. They can't be speculation. Put the speculation maybe in the discussion. In fact, a lot of people who give many, many presentations, and I think I've given you know, two, three hundred, maybe four hundred different presentations in my lifetime, will tell you that the conclusion should almost be anticlimactic for the audience. They should have come to those same conclusions before you got to them, because they should be uh, definitive and and quite clear from the subject that you present. There shouldn't, this is not Perry Mason or you know, CSI or something where you're, where you're pulling a surprise witness out of the, out of the back. All right, this is not a mystery novel we're presenting here. This stuff should be, be very clear from your report. And if it's not, then you need to go back to your report and your, your presentation and reorganize so that it is clear. Now, in the last few minutes, I want to discuss a few mechanics of your presentation that I, that I think can really really help. And I define, not I, but other people who talk about communication define noise is anything that interferes with the transfer of information. Right? So clearly, noise can be like this. And Paul 
in the background. You, can probably, you hear those jangling? Yeah, you hear the jangling. But if I go like this and I say, you know, in the gloom, can you really mad at you if you don't need something? You know, what did I just say? You don't know, right, obviously. I said, Mrs. McGlynn is going to get mad at you if you don't eat something, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, clear case of noise. But there are other aspects of noise that we can talk about. And so some presentation techniques that can help you eliminate noise. One is face the audience. You don't give your talk surrounded in the blanket. Now, there's probably going to be a podium and a microphone. The important thing is to make sure you speak into the microphone because what's really weird with microphones is Oftentimes, if the microphone is here, here, it's not, it's directional. And so if you're turning your head, what it sounds like to the audience, even though you sound loud, it sounds like you're talking like this, and then you get quiet, and then you get loud again, and then you get quiet, and then you get loud again. It's very difficult for the audience to follow that, and they, they lose track. Notice how I pointed to the images on the screen sometimes, and sometimes I used a pointer. Um, very important. And I re I'm just reminded of, of I'm now, I have young children, and I'm now reading to them. And one of the big things that all the experts say is point to the pictures in the book when you're reading to reinforce the connection between the word and the image. And so if you just stand there and give your talk, a couple of things. There, the audience may or may not know which line you're on. They, are you talking about this or this or this? When you point, it's pretty clear that I'm pointing here. Okay? You give an outline, that means you're going to stick to something. We talked about perhaps one minute per slide. I put this number up to say no more than one minute per slide because the audience is going to start, their minds are going to start wandering. If there's a lot of stuff up here and you're talking about this, they're going to be, you guys read this whole thing before I started talking about it, didn't you? Yeah, say so you did. I know you did. You read this part, right, before I, before I got to that. One, one technique that I sometimes use, especially with PowerPoint, is you can make those little numbers come up as you talk about them? Yes? The problem with the situation this time is that someone is hitting for us, and the optical clicker may not necessarily work. So how do you maintain fluidity? Because, at, because of the situation, I'm going to put everything on the slide at once. So how do you maintain control and fluidity of the presentation if you're not in control of the PowerPoint? Well, somehow you, you can be in control of the PowerPoint. I've, I've done that. And you know, a nod or a next, please. And, if, you, if you're consistent, and, and part of it is just looking like you know what's going on. And so if you get up there and you say, you give your title slide and you say, I'd like to, like to thank my co-author so-and-so, thank you, next please. And they click to the next one. Then you talk and you say, if you say next please, like it, it becomes part of your routine, then it becomes part of the flow. It sounds kind of weird unless you practice it, but if you do, you can incorporate some little, whatever your signal is, some people you know, will you know, tip their hat or, or some you know, thumbs up, whatever you're going to do. It should be fairly subtle, but try to incorporate that into the flow of your talk. And I, and I think that will work. And if they don't click when you want them to, the best thing is, is just pause, be silent, wait for it to come up, and then move on. The hardest thing I think any speaker can learn is uh, how to not say uh when you're thinking, right? Um, hmm. it's, it's hard to do because you're standing here and you're thinking, what's my thought? And it feels to you, you know, like 20 minutes is dragging by, but to the audience, it's only a half a second. And you need to be aware of that. So it's okay to be silent for a second or two. And that will not, I don't, I don't believe, will interfere with the flow of your presentation. Try that and see if that works. I th control the practice. Absolutely. Because the practice before you get Absolutely. to that point so that you're prepared for that inconvenience or what you look yeah. like or you're thinking like your own. Um, your own, um, exactly. Mm -hmm. You should definitely practice the presentation. I, we'll have time to see a slide on that. I would suggest when I tell my students to practice and when I do it, don't over practice. I suggest doing it once by yourself. Now, this is the weirdest thing ever. You get into a little room with a PowerPoint presentation, and you give your presentation to the general audience, as it, you know, to an empty room as if they were there, and you're talking to yourself. And it's very strange. But if you can push yourself through that and get, get to the point where you can give your talk to yourself, then you give it to a couple of friends, and you get them to really rip you apart. 
because you want your friends to do it, not, not somebody you don't know, right? You get your friends to give you comments on it, and then you do it again. Maybe so four times. Once by yourself or twice by yourself. Once to your friends. Make some corrections. Give it again to your friends. If you're a little nervous, give it again to yourself. But don't do it more than that because you get bored with your, with your own talk. And if you're going up there and saying, oh my God, this is the eighth time I've given this talk today. You guys really want to hear this? It's really, I'm, I'm tired of giving this talk. You know, forget it. Nobody's going to listen to you. Practicing is very important, so thank you for bringing that up. Try that. See if, see if that works for you. you know, the, presentation fits in that time window. Oh, yes, absolutely. You don't want to overextend your time. Absolutely, absolutely. Unless you've given a lot of presentations, and I've, I have to admit I've done this, I I've, I've really haven't prepared as much as I'd like for a presentation, and I've gotten up in front of the, the class, and I'm watching the time, and I'm getting down. I have three minutes and like 80 slides to go. You know, then I have to make some decisions on my feet what to go over. You know, I've got all these notes here. That's the other thing. The audience doesn't know what your notes are. The audience doesn't know what you planned to say. So if you leave something out, they're not going to know. And nobody's going to come up and say, weren't you going to talk about uh, that thing? They don't know that. So the point is, the presentation you actually give is the presentation you plan to give, whether it was or not. <laughs> At the end of it, you say, thank you. And you go home. And, and that, you don't worry about something you didn't get to if you've had to cut something. Summarize. Now, we spent a lot of time on this slide because we had questions. But I was going to say, one thing you can do with PowerPoint is, again, you can make each one of these uh, numbers come up if you play with the animation. It's not very difficult to do. I can show you how to do it. If you want to come by and see me, I can show you how to do it in, in five or 10 minutes. And then the audience isn't reading ahead of where you are. So finally, summarize. And this is what I say. Tell them what you told them. All right? And a few seconds on effective visual aids. One idea per slide. I like to use keywords, but I may talk a little bit more about the subject than you see on the slide. So notice the only thing I wrote there is keywords, but I'm talking about keywords. Uh, this one says use, use large type or print, in case you couldn't see it. Uh, limit the colors and the fonts. You don't need to be fancy with these presentations. You don't need flashing fonts all over the place. You don't need to figure out how many of Microsoft's uh, embedded fonts you can use. There's no prize for that. All right? Don't use red for text. Turns out that, first of all, red is the lowest energy light. It's very hard to see. The lights were dimmer. Red actually starts to shift. It's really weird. If you don't believe me, make a slide of all red text and just watch it for a few seconds. And then the complementary color, I don't know if you know about this, but the image that's burned on your retina for red is like the cyan, this blue. So you start seeing this blue stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, it's that American flag thing where you look at this funny color American flag, and then you look at a white wall, and the red, white, and blue is imprinted on your eyeball. So don't use red. Define all terms and symbols. This is the symbol for the Chinese monetary unit yuan. So that's just an example. Keep your graphs and graphics simple. Avoid jargon and big words, because people aren't in your field like onomatopoeia, elucidation, or consanguinously. Those are just some examples of big words. So in summary, use an outline to organize your presentation. The introduction presents the background material. That's why you're doing your work. I'll go up here. The methods tells how you did your work. The results shows what happened, what you actually got. The discussion explains what it means, why your work's important. The conclusions should be based on the data. And by all means, as much as you can, keep your presentation simple. It doesn't need to be fancy to impart your information. So I had some example slides. This is just a slide I wanted to show you where you, where you can get a little fancy. And here, here I'm telling people when I give this talk what I do in my laboratory. And I've actually timed this so that I can follow along and explain in words what each picture means. I spent a lot of time working on this. Um, but I can't. So when this comes up, I'm talking about it, this one, this one, this one. But also with this particular slide, I wanted to show the scope of my work. Now, not to necessarily impress people, but to show people that, that we do a lot of stuff in our lab. So I wanted to give them some idea and make it a little fancy. Um, so I'm going to end here. I'm not going to show you a lot of example slides and ask if you have any questions about any of this, either for me or 
or Janet in, in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, as far as using PowerPoint, if you need to skip something on your feet, if you need to cut kind of short or quickly, basically, aren't they going to know that you skip something? Well, if, if you have to skip a slide, it's OK. Uh, and I say, based, when I have a slide that I'm going to skip, I'll say, I put it up there and say, I'm going to skip this. You know, to, or in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this, which is fine. And that's all. You don't, sp you don't dwell on it. You don't say, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, sorry to have to skip this slide. Just say, I'm going to skip this slide. Move on. Just keep it very matter of fact. More so than anything, the, imp the appearance that you're in control of what's going on, that you made a conscious decision to pass over that slide, is going to keep your presentation smoothly, moving smoothly, and it's going to keep the audience with you. That's what I would suggest with that. Anything else? Yes? Do you particularly like yellow and blue? I particularly like yellow and blue because in a dark room, um, I don't know if I have a white background slide. Yeah. I, well, this is not this is not white enough. But in, in if you use white for for the background, it, it's that's the main source of light. It can kind of blind people. They get used to it after a while. I think this is easy on the eyes. I've I use the cream. Other other, you, other people use you can have your own background. I mean, people have different backgrounds. I mean, UMBC has a quote standard background that they've used for presentations. If you want to use some other color. I, I prefer to watch presentations where the background color is not a screaming bright color, like yellow, you know, really bright yellow or white. It's just because it's, it's harder to see. And I think I read somewhere, for example, even when reading books, white print on a black page is actually easier for people to read. It's easier on the eyes than the, white, the black print on the white page, but it's just more expensive. You know? So you know, how do you do that? So, I like the, the blue. And the, it used to be that there was a slide um, before PowerPoint. You could make slides, and the emulsion on the slides took a black and white and changed it to a blue background with a yellow. And that was done on purpose because people realized that that was very easy to see. And so I've just sort of carried that over. You can use anything you want. I've just found it extraordinarily successful in the past to have one or two lines of text on the slide completely dead or black against white background. And yeah, if you want to do that, then I would suggest make it all. Don't sort of just have subtle colors and then blast out a white slide with, oh, no, with yeah. The entire presentation is white, so. Right. Just curious. Oh, I've seen, I've seen it's, a lot of different colors. It's just pre yeah. It's just it's just my my preference. So I don't think there's anything. You know, nobody's going to get a prize for the best color scheme. Just make sure it's readable. Again, if you give it to some friends, then ask them what did they think of the of the background and the and the text colors. Was it readable? Was it easy on the eyes? Anything else? Thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. Appreciate you being here. <laughs>